Now we're ready to look at the last part of respiratory physiology, and that's the gas transport. We've seen how to breathe, so we've got the oxygen into our lungs, get the CO2 out of our lungs. We've looked at gas exchange. How does that oxygen or CO2 move across the respiratory membrane or how it moves from the blood into the tissues or vice versa? But we haven't done is looked at how the gases are transported in the blood. So in this video, we're going to concentrate on oxygen. The next video will concentrate on CO2. So first, though, an overall look at gas transport. Oxygen and carbon dioxide aren't very soluble in plasma, so we need something to store excess or more oxygen and CO2, and that's the job of the red blood cells. So imagine with oxygen, if you have a lot of oxygen in the alveoli, the oxygen is going to diffuse from the alveoli into the plasma. Now the Plasma can't hold much oxygen, so if we were limited to that, we wouldn't have much oxygen in our blood. But the red blood cell can pick up all of that oxygen, or a lot of that oxygen, and then store it in its red blood cell. And so as soon as we move some of that oxygen into the red blood cell, then more oxygen can diffuse into the plasma. And that will keep going. As oxygen diffuses in the plasma, the red blood cell picks it up. And then that will keep going until we leave the lungs. Once we get to the tissues, then the oxygen that's in the plasma still will diffuse into the tissues. So now we have less in the plasma, so we can take that oxygen and move it into the plasma out of the red blood cell, and then have more diffuse to the tissues. And so oxygen will keep diffusing to the tissues as long as we're there at the tissues, and we have oxygen in the hemoglobin in the red blood cell to replace that which diffused into the tissues that was in the plasma. And we can do the same thing with the CO2. CO2 will diffuse from the tissues into the capillaries, but then it can't hold much. So the plasma CO2 will get picked up by the red blood cells and stored there. And so we lower the plasma level of CO2, so more CO2 can diffuse in. And we keep picking it up then in the red blood cell. When we arrive in the lungs, then that CO2 that's in the plasma will go and diffuse into the alveoli and then I can take more CO2 and dump into the plasma. And then that CO2 will then get removed into the alveoli. So think of the red blood cell kind of as a um, reservoir for oxygen and CO2. And it simply replaces the oxygen or CO2 that was moved from the plasma. Now in oxygen transport, of course, you remember that oxygen is stored on hemoglobin. And we looked at that when we talked about blood. But just as a reminder, hemoglobin is composed of two beta globins and two alpha globins, each one that has a heme inside of it. And the heme has the iron, and that's where the oxygen binds. So one hemoglobin can carry four molecules of oxygen. And if it does carry those four oxygens, it's called oxyhemoglobin. If I release all that oxygen, we call it deoxyhemoglobin. Now hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. So that means it can bind very easily and very tightly with oxygen, and, but it also has a unique kind of uh, relationship with the oxygen. That is, every time you add an oxygen, the hemoglobin will change its shape and make it easier for the next oxygen to bind. So you can imagine one oxygen binds with the hemoglobin, hemoglobin altered shape. Now the second one can bind to it tighter. Tweaks its shape again. The third one binds even tighter tweaks again, and the fourth one binds even tighter than that. So I'm changing the shape of the hemoglobin every time I added oxygen, increasing the affinity for every single oxygen added. Now carbon monoxide has even a higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen does, and that's why you die from carbon monoxide poisoning, is simply that the carbon monoxide, when it's inhaled, quickly binds with the hemoglobin and does not let go. So that means the oxygen has nothing to bind to. It can't bind to the hemoglobin because it's occupied by carbon monoxide at a much better rate or strength than the oxygen would be. And so you're limited on how much oxygen you can actually transport, and therefore you don't get enough oxygen in your tissues. Now, oxygen has a unique relationship with 
or between its partial pressure and its percent saturation on the hemoglobin and that's seen here in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and you can see here that as we increase the partial pressure of oxygen the percent saturation in hemoglobin increases now what do I mean by percent saturation well it's how saturated the hemoglobin molecules are if it's hundred percent saturated that means every single hemoglobin has four oxygens bound to it if it's fifty percent saturated that means on average two out of the four spots are occupied by oxygen for every single hemoglobin molecule we have if it's seventy five percent saturated then three out of four spots on average are occupied twenty five percent you get it one out of four spots on average is occupied by oxygen okay so notice though that this is not a straight line that is actually a curve and that's going to be important and it's also related to this idea of increasing affinity with adding another oxygen now this also this relationship happens just if I had a beaker full of hemoglobin and I put it in a box where I could control the partial pressure of the oxygen around that beaker of hemoglobin and that's what these are symbolizing down here so in other words let's first even disconnect it from our body and think of just about what happens in a beaker so here's let's say our beaker of hemoglobin and I put this in a box and in that box it's sealed and I can make the partial pressure let's say 104 which is the partial pressure in our lungs but remember we're just thinking about it in a box right now if I looked at this beaker that's got a partial pressure of oxygen around it in the air around it that's 104 partial pressure and I looked and examined that hemoglobin according to this graph what I would find is that hemoglobin would be 98 percent saturated okay because that's what this curve is showing me that that at a partial pressure of 104 hemoglobin is just naturally going to be 98 percent saturated almost hundred percent very close okay now if I put that beaker or take that same beaker but I drop the partial pressure down to 40 okay so I take that same box I just change the atmosphere around it and I drop it down to 40 partial pressure according to this graph then hemoglobin at that partial pressure can only be 75 percent saturated that is under that partial pressure the hemoglobin cannot hold as much oxygen it can only hold 75 percent at 104 it can hold a 98 percent but at 40 it can only hold 75 percent so but it was at 98 percent now because it's in a, in a different environment that is a partial pressure of 40 it ends up only holding 75 percent so where did the other 23 percent go well if it was in our body that 23 percent is what's available to the tissues so in our lungs we have a partial pressure of nine of 104 meaning we're 98 percent saturated so the blood leaving the lungs is going to be 98 percent saturated but when it gets to our tissues the tissue partial pressure is only 40 and we've saw that when we were doing gas exchange so partial pressure under 40 at 40 says hemoglobin can only be 75 percent saturated it can't hold all 98 percent it can only hold 75 percent so that means 23 percent of the oxygens have to be let go they're released off of the hemoglobin and that's what's going to be available to our tissues okay the rest the 75 percent of the oxygens are going to end up being transported back on the hemoglobins as we go back to the lungs and then at the lungs we pick up more oxygens because now we're at a partial pressure of 104 we can add get 98 percent saturated so we can add that 23 back to the tissues now we're at partial pressure of 40 so all we can release or all we can hold on to the hemoglobin is 75 percent but it came in 98% so the difference there means 23% is available to our tissues and that's what's released not a lot it seems like but enough obviously it works for us now imagine you're exercising 
In the lungs, you're still going to get a, almost 100%, 98% saturation, because you're still at a partial pressure of 104, meaning as the blood leaves the lungs, it's 98% saturated. But since you're exercising, the partial pressure is only 20 in the tissues. You're using up more oxygen. Okay? So your tissues need it. Your muscles are using up the oxygen. So the partial pressure is much lower. According to this graph, then, the hemoglobin can only hang on to 35% of that oxygen. It can only be 35% saturated. But it came into the tissues 98% saturated. And the best it can do at 20 partial pressure is be 35% saturated. That means then that that difference here, that's what's available to tissues. So we have 63% of the oxygen is released to our tissues, and that's what's available to our tissues, which makes sense. Obviously, we're exercise, we're using more oxygen, so let's make more available. Yay, we have more available. Tissues can now handle the increase in exercise and have more oxygen available to it. Okay? Now there's something else that goes on too with oxygen hemoglobin dissociation and that has to do with exercise. Again, now in exercise we get a drop in pH, an increase in temperature, an increase in partial pressure of CO2, and an increase in a compound called 2,3-BPG which is just a byproduct of cell metabolism um, when you're breaking down sugars. Now when that what happens then is we get what's called the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect is this change in the curve. That is the curve shifts to the right. So remember we were looking at this line, normal pH. Now we've got a drop in pH. So let's see what happens. Well at the lungs, remember we've got a partial pressure of about 104. If it didn't shift to the right the percent saturation is about 98. With a shift to the right, it's a little bit lower, but maybe not hardly anything, maybe another, maybe a percent. But let's just say it stays at 98 just to make the math nicer, okay? So not much of a change of anything. Where the see the big changes over here in the tissues. Remember when we said that when exercise, the partial pressure of the oxygen, when we're exercising, is going to be down to 20 because we're using more of it up. If the curve didn't shift to the right, we'd use this one. And the tissues, we'd see that this is about 35% saturation. So that meant we had about 63%, the 98 we started in the lungs, you can only hold on to 35% in the tissue. That means that 63% is now available to my tissues. But with the Bohr effect, with a shift to the right, now I'm on this curve, that means the hemoglobin can only hang on to 25% of the oxygen, but it came in 98% saturated, so the difference is now I add another 10%, so now I have 73% available to my tissues. Yay, I just got more. That's the whole idea of the Bohr effect, the shift, is that I get, as it shifts to the right, I make more oxygen available because that means I can't hold on to as much oxygen on the hemoglobin when that curve shifts to the right. So I get more. Now, an adequate delivery of oxygen to the tissues is called hypoxia. And we call it hypoxia regardless of the cause. A person who is hypoxic will become cyanotic. And cyanotic means that bluish cast to the skin usually see that when the hemoglobin saturation falls below 75%. So you might hear someone say that their PSAP is, you know, 98% or whatever. That's great. If you hear a patient's SATs, PSATs have fallen below 75% or 75, then you know that guy is in trouble. He's not getting oxygen delivery to his body tissues. There are different kinds of hypoxia. There could be anemic hypoxia, just simply you don't have enough red blood cells or hemoglobin. Ischemic hypoxia is when blood circulation is impaired. So think of congestive heart failure or an embolism or thrombi that's blocking blood flow so you don't get good circulation. Histotoxic hypoxia is when blood cells are unable to use the oxygen. They get the oxygen just fine, but they can't use it. Example of cyanide poisoning. 
that for you um, biochemists out there, uh, cyanide interferes with the electron transport chain. Um, and so you don't get moving electrons along that chain to finally be connected to the oxygen. For those not doing biochem, don't worry about it. Um, hypoxemic hypoxia is uh, reduced blood partial pressures of oxygen. Could be because you have poor ventilation for fusion coupling. That is, you're just not matching it, something going on with the lungs there, um, where you're not, maybe it's COPD, for example, or carbon monoxide poisoning when all those oxygen spots are taken up by um, carbon monoxide in the hemoglobin. Any of those could lead to hypoxia. So that's going to end our look at transport of oxygen. In the next video, we'll start looking at CO2.